Real Agriculture Soybean School is brought to you by Basic Seeds and Lollamond Plant Care. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to the Soybean School. Today I'm in Hamilton, Ontario, catching up with Jake Monroe, OMAFA's soil management specialist. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. It's, uh, it's always neat to be, get out and, uh, you know, talk about some of the research you're doing. Um, today I want to talk about the importance of getting some cover crop on the ground after soybeans. And uh, hey, that's what we're standing in here right now. Tell us about, uh, you know, one, I guess, what we're standing in and why it's so important to establish a cover crop after soybeans. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Bern, you know, r roughly speaking, we got about 3 million acres of soybeans, give or take, in a, in a given year, and only about a million acres of winter wheat. And so there are many acres of soybeans uh, that are, you know, that go to corn the following year where we've got minimal residue cover kind of over the course of the winter. So this project that we're going to be talking about really is all about uh, how can we get some late season cover crop established and uh, we're going to talk more about how how we do that in an innovative way. Exactly. So I mean this is some work you've done with the Living Labs and uh, um, we'll talk about more of those uh, plots that you're running but uh, what's interesting about this is how you seeded it. This was seeded with a drone last fall. Tell us about that. Yeah so drone seeding technology pretty pretty new pretty new to Ontario. It's just been a few years where drones have been out there doing doing some seeding um, and with this project we really wanted to evaluate you know how how effective can, can drones be at seeding cover crop into standing soybeans, standing corn? A couple of benefits of drones uh, over other seeding methods. Uh, one, they can get in under any uh, condition. So you have a couple inches of rain and the next day the drone is in there seeding uh, in the moist conditions, not doing any compaction or damage to the field. Also, uh, it gives the opportunity in a standing crop to not have uh, 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 trampling of, of crop and any crop losses. Um, so some real positives, it's, uh, it's a really neat opportunity and the drone technology has come a long way in the last couple of years uh, yeah. in terms of capacity and, and speed at which they're able to do that. Now this is a dairy farm, Leslie Miles Dairy Farm just outside Hamilton. Hey, what's in it for him? Well, let's let uh, Leslie tell us that himself. Hey Leslie, hey, thanks for the invite. Great to be on the farm today. Um, let's talk about uh, why, uh, why cover crops, why after soybeans, you know, what are you trying to achieve? Okay, so uh, a few years ago we started to add soybeans into our cropping rotation and they're a great little plant to come up with some pretty good yields and uh, so that's got us on the soybean uh, bandwagon so we started to grow but we noticed after a few years that there seem to be problems with soil erosion. Uh, the soybean plant, it's possibly the plant itself is part of the issue. It seems to disintegrate rather than holding a fibrous root mass like corn does or alfalfa does. So uh, we were concerned we were seeing more and more erosion. So we thought possibly a cover crop would be a, a really good thing to try. Tell me about a drone. Well, the drone uh, to me is an extremely exciting thing because of the timing. Um, farming is a lot of timing. It's kind of, uh, you have to do things just at the right time. And uh, there are so many things that prevent you from doing that. Uh, you're harvesting first, second, third cut of hay. Uh, you've got corn silage to come off and, and to get a cover crop established. Um, the planting after soybeans, uh, to me, seems to be a bit of a logistical problem. Uh, we have some regular fall rains, which uh, anyone who's in agriculture knows uh, on a finer soil you've got a couple of days waiting after the rain before you can actually get back in the field so your time is really compressed mm -hmm. so the drone fits perfectly in that uh, because you can go as long as it's not heavy rainfall so that was fantastic the other thing about drone seeding that's got me sort of excited um, I had a neighbor that did some aerial seeding with a small aircraft and he had some problems with the placement of seed and he felt that was from the operator being maybe a little sloppy and maybe it's too fast going over the field. But the drone gives you a, an option to go fairly slow and to get placement 100% accurate because you've entered the whole new realm of computer maps and seed placement is going, the track of the drone will be deadly accurate hmm. so you're going to get seed placed properly now they're coming a long way with the drones so um, 
they're getting better and better all the time. But this was pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. So, Jake, a lot of, uh, I guess, Leslie's comments were about erosion. Now, when you look around and look at what type of catch you have here with the drone, are you happy with the ground cover you get? Oh, extremely pleased with this uh, particular treatment. So we're here standing in cereal rye. It was drone seeded on September 26th in the 30-inch uh, row soybeans. Uh, you had a really nice catch in the fall that, that we've seen at Established, and you can see the growth here, uh, uh, you know, just the first part of May. Uh, quite impressive. Let's talk about this crop here, Jake. Are you happy with the biomass? I mean, you got a lot of tillers here. You don't have a lot of seed down, but the tillers are incredible. Yeah, exactly. So you really can see kind of how um, a cereal like winter rye responds when it's got some space to grow and expand. We only have about yeah, kind of three or four plants per square foot. Um, but what you can see with each plant is that it's sent out about 15, 20 tillers and kind of looks like a bunch grass. So uh, that's contributed a lot to, to the biomass and kind of the coverage that we're seeing here. Um, and, and, you know, in a sense, help compensate for, you know, a relatively sparse stand, but you know, adaptive in that sense is kind of spreading out. How about last fall? How did this look? We got some photos here. Um, you know, the catch was pretty good. Yeah, the catch was pretty good. I, I should mention as well in this in this trial here at Leslie's, we had uh, cereal rye seeded, oats seeded, and red clover, and we actually got a nice catch of both the oats and the cereal rye. Of course, the oats did did winter kill. We had you know a little bit of growth in the fall, and there's some opportunity to tweak that. Look at maybe earlier seeding. Uh, see if we can get some more growth out of a winter killed species. Um, but yeah, we we really Really, you know, quite pleased with the catch yeah. that we got here. Uh, fairly uniform across the full length of the field exactly. with the rye. Let's talk about your timing and what uh, you know. Should we be going earlier? You know, do we want to get it uh, before leaf drop? I know we had a big leaf drop here when you were seeding last year. Drone technology is, is newer to you know to Ontario to North America, but uh, aerial seeding is not a new concept. It's been around for decades. Uh, so a lot of those principles we can we can follow and learn from uh, you know kind of past experience. Uh, we were a little bit on the late side, so end of September is when this was seeded. Um, we, we really kind of want to generally want to target with the aerial seeding, aerial interseeding, um, kind of just before you get most of the leaves dropping and, and ideally kind of get the seed down and some leaf drop on top. And then, you know, hopefully Mother Nature cooperates and we get a decent rainfall to get, get those uh, uh, plants started. Um, so uh, yeah, a lot comes down to timing. Uh, again, the nice part about the drone is we do have a little more flexibility to get in the field there uh, uh, if conditions conditions are, are a bit tacky, uh, we can kind of uh, move quickly and, and uh, be more timely in that yeah. sense. Now, um, let's wrap it up. You're back in the field again this year with Leslie, with Living Labs. What's, uh, what's the research look like this year? What's, what's, what are you hoping to learn? Yeah, so the Living Lab Ontario project, which I should say is, is one of many happening across the province that, that they all started last fall or this spring. Uh, but we're looking ahead with our four cooperators to, uh, to tweaking some of what we did last year. So we're going to be uh, attempting two different drone drone seeding timings uh, into soybeans and we're going to be uh, continuing to look at uh, some different species options. Uh, we'll, we'll evaluate oats again. Uh, the gr growers really do want to try to get something uh, going with uh, a legume so we will give red clover another shot um, and of course we will we'll keep seeing uh, what cereal rye can do for us and kind of how uh, how the management kind of comes through to the following year. Right. Well great stuff Jake, uh, always great to catch up with you. Um, we'll be back maybe in the fall or next spring, see how you do. Yeah, stay tuned, we'll have lots to learn over the three years of this project. You can find more episodes of the Soybean School by going to soybeanschool.com or finding the Real Agriculture YouTube channel.